All right, everybody, I am here for Unit 5. Uh, thanks to McGraw-Hill for uh, most of the slides. I've mixed some information in here a little bit as well, but a lot of this is, is coming from them, from our textbook maker. Uh, unit 5 is Ocean and Atmospheric Circulation. Uh, a lot of that is going to have to do with currents uh, as we work our way through the unit, but there are going to be a number of other things that fall under uh, this kind of overarching category as well. Uh, I will ask your forgiveness for this ahead of time. I don't think it'll be a distraction, but my clicker is not working today, so I'm having to manually hit the button on the computer. Uh, 5.1, our lesson is atmospheric circulation, and then we will work our way down into the water for the rest of the unit. Uh, but it starts with the atmosphere. Uh, the movement in the atmosphere is ultimately what uh, is causing most of the movement in the water. Uh, and so uh, make sure that you're following along in your study guide. You're going to be writing the parts that are bold. If it's not bold, then don't bother writing it. And remember that your Unit 5 test is going to be open note, so you do want to make sure that you have these notes well taken. Uh, but the slides are available in Schoology as well, so you can watch these lectures. Uh, but also, if you need to reference them without having to see the video again, you can go back in and, and look at just the slides as well. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm not writing anything off of this first one. It'll just introduce the topic for us a little bit. Uh, ocean circulation profoundly affects marine organisms and their habitats as well as Earth's climate and therefore all terrestrial habitats, even the things that are not in the water. Uh, the atmosphere and the ocean are closely linked and their dynamic interactions create weather and climate over the surface of the Earth. Uh, so now we get into our first section on your study guide, atmospheric structure. We're writing the bold part here. Earth's atmosphere consists of 90 kilometers of well-mixed gases above its land and water. The gas molecules are closer together near Earth's surface and then they get farther apart as altitude increases. We're not writing that down because we've actually mentioned this idea before. This is a continuation of the idea of density stratification in the same way that Earth's layers are uh, more dense at the center and get less dense as you go out. The atmosphere works the same way. It's, it's thicker, more dense towards the ground, and gets less dense as you work your way towards outer space. The atmosphere is divided into distinct layers. Again, right, just the bold part here. Those layers starting from the bottom are troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, an exosphere. Uh, in previous science classes, you probably have done a little bit more with those uh, and talking more about, uh, about earth science. Uh, but for now, we just want to know the names of those layers. Image here uh, that kind of shows the kilometers there. All right. Heating the atmosphere, uh, we're actually, we're still going to write this one as a part of atmospheric structure. Uh, and when we get to uneven heating, we got a, quite a bit to write. So this is going to be included in our first box still. Our climate is ultimately controlled by the sun and the ocean. What controls Earth's climate? Uh, the sun and the ocean are the two main things that decide what our climate is like. Some of the sun's light energy is reflected uh, back into space. Some of it, but most of it, is absorbed by Earth's atmosphere and the surface, including the ocean, uh, and is converted from light into heat. Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's a little too much. That will be a recurring theme. Uh, uneven heating. We're moving on to our second box here. Uh, so the sun's light energy is not evenly distributed across Earth's surface. Uh, this is because of the angle of the sun's rays. If that doesn't make sense yet, I'm going to keep on explaining it. Hopefully it will. Uh, be because of the angle of the sun's rays changes the Earth's latitude. Uh, with Earth's latitude, the radiation is greatest at the equator, and then it declines going to the poles. Uh, so give you an image. Again, uh, you have the ability here to pause and hit play. If I'm going too quickly, uh, then just stop me. <laughs> you can stop me yourself and, uh, and get caught up and then hit play again. So a little image here of how it works. Uh, these center rays here are hitting Earth perpendicularly. 
uh, and this is where the uh, the greatest intensity of heat is going to be felt. And you get to these outer parts here, it's more of a, a glancing blow. The sun's rays are hitting at a different angle and, and glancing off. There's still heat to be felt there, but not nearly as much as there is here. It's not necessarily just about the, the distance. It is closer here than it is here, uh, but it's also about the angle. These rays hitting straight on as opposed to this glancing blow. Imagine uh, like if you watch boxing and, and see somebody getting hit in the face. Uh, you have that like slow-mo shot of them getting punched square in the face and everything just uh, wobbling around and a direct impact. Or you can watch a shot of a glancing blow that goes off the side. Obviously the direct shot uh, looks like it, it's gonna hurt a little bit more than that glancing blow. Uh, so it's similar here with what, uh, with what the sun's rays are doing. Even if we were to just hold a, uh, if I were to put a, a little space heater in front of my head and, and put my face right in front of it, my, my head's a good example, it looks like a globe. Uh, so the space heater is right here. Uh, this part of my face that's, that's directly being hit by the heat is what's gonna get the warmest. The sides are still gonna feel the heat, but it's not gonna be to the same degree. Uh, that's the same concept there. Continue writing here, same category, uneven heating. Uh, so the sun's rays are most concentrated when they are perpendicular to the Earth's surface. We said that already in our image, but now we're letting you see it here and get it down. Uh, so most concentrated when they are perpendicular. Uh, so the rays that strike Earth's surface are farther from the equator, spread out more. I don't even worry about that. Uh, so. Uh, I don't like the way that that is worded. Focus on the part that is bold. The sun's rays are most concentrated when they're perpendicular to Earth's surface. And one last one for uneven heating here. Uh, so the combination of rays spreading over a larger surface and traveling through more atmosphere uh, with latitude is what causes the tropics to be warmer than the poles, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's go ahead and get this part down. This uneven heating is the driving force behind wind and currents. That's not going to make a whole lot of sense yet, but it will uh, hopefully make a little more sense going forward. So uneven heating is what causes our wind and currents. We'll move on to our next section, greenhouse gases. Uh, so greenhouse gases are, are gases in the atmosphere that block heat from bouncing back into space. The heat comes in, the rays come in, uh, and some of them escape, some of them do not. These greenhouse gases are, are what absorb this heat, what absorb those rays and, and keep that heat from being able to escape back out. Uh, the most important greenhouse gases are water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Uh, note at the bottom here, you don't have to re write this, but greenhouse gases keep earth warm and hospitable for life. We need these greenhouse gases. They are very important. There has to be some of these gases in the air to keep all of our heat from escaping or we would be too cold. Uh, however, we also run the danger of putting too much of these gases into the atmosphere and having the opposite effect, which will be a more recurring theme in what we'll talk about. Uh, just an image here, the sun's rays coming in, uh, trying to escape, but being blocked here uh, by some of these greenhouse gases. All right, so still in uh, the greenhouse effect here. So Antarctic uh, ice cores show that uh, over the last 400,000 years uh, and incorporating multiple ice or ages, the atmospheric CO2 has fluctuated between about 180 and 300 parts per million. So a range there for 400,000 years, we've stayed in that range of 180 to 300 parts per million until recently, until the Industrial Revolution, where those parts per million have slowly been uh, climbing, slowly is not the right word, uh, we're slowly climbing and then rapidly uh, shot up to, now we are around 410 parts per million. Uh, so that is the highest in at least 800,000 years. Uh, it was only a couple of decades ago where scientists uh, knew we were over 300 and were wanting to keep it at 350 and then keep it at 380 and then keep it at four. Uh, and, and now we're over four, it is rapidly uh, increasing and we have thus far failed to uh, really provide much of an answer. So you see here, 400,000 years 
up and down, up and down, up and down, and then you really can hardly see it here because it's right at the end, uh, but it, it shoots up over the, the last 70 or 80 years here uh, to higher than it has been in a uh, very, very, very long time. All right, vertical and global circulation. Uh, no, nothing you need to write here, but I'll mention it real quick. The air in the atmosphere is constantly in motion. The uneven heating of Earth's surface, uh, as well as the rotational pattern, are responsible for uh, for the wind and weather patterns experienced on land and at sea. Move on to our Coriolis effect. This is our next box, uh, and this is going to be a very important term going forward for us for the rest of the unit. So the Coriolis effect describes the pattern of deflection taken by objects uh, that are not firmly connected to the ground as they travel along distances around the earth. So we're talking about, uh, for modern time, we're talking about, uh, about airplanes uh, or maybe other th like things like clouds that we might be able to see in the air, but primarily uh, like air travel uh, for humans is what's gonna be largely impacted by this. So the Coriolis effect is responsible for large scale weather patterns. That's one thing that we want to know about it. Honestly, that probably should have come later uh, after a little more explanation of what it is, but you can go ahead and jot it down now. So the key to the Coriolis effect lies in the Earth's rotation. Specifically, the Earth rotates faster at the equator than it does at the poles. Take a moment and think about that. The Earth, the Earth is rotating, but every every place on Earth, it takes a full 24 hours to rotate. Uh, so at the equator, you're having to make that 24 hour rotation at a much higher speed in order to get there because you're going a much farther distance than somebody say at one of the poles who gets to do that rotation very slowly uh, because their circle isn't as much. Uh, so we, for example, in Florida are, are going about 800 miles an hour right now uh, as, the earth, uh, as the earth rotates. Um, the, the folks who are on the equator doing roughly uh, 1,000 miles an hour, and then that, that gets smaller and smaller uh, as, really as you go in either direction away from the equator. Uh, the circumference of the, the circle that, that is being traveled for that rotation gets smaller, and so it takes... Um, takes less speed to be able to complete that rotation in a 24 hour period. Uh, this spinning uh, is responsible for, uh, for a lot of our, our wind patterns. You can imagine eh, at 800 miles an hour, uh, there's gonna be some effect in the atmosphere of that spinning. We get a little image here uh, of how this impacts things like, uh, like air travel. So, uh, from the North Pole, let's say we're, we're trying to fly from the North Pole to San Diego, uh, you can't just fly in a straight line. What's going to happen? If you just take off from the North Pole and go to San Diego, uh, well, because of the Earth's rotation, by the time you get to San Diego, San Diego is not going to be there anymore. <laughs> it will be somewhere over here. The Earth is rotating this way, uh, and San Diego is on the move. And so you cannot aim the, aim the airplane for where San Diego is you have to aim the airplane for where it is going to be. Uh, kind of like a receiver trying, or a, a quarterback trying to hit a wide receiver, uh, you can't necessarily throw it right where he is. If he's still running, uh, if he, let's say he's running a fly route, going, heading down the field, you can't hit him where he's at. You've got to put the ball out in front of him where he's going to be. Uh, well, we have to do the same thing with, uh, with flights around the world. We cannot go in a straight line. We have to time it uh, with where that city is going to be by the time the airplane gets there. All right, vertical air circulation. Uh, we're gonna, let's see here. Go ahead and, and keep this in your Coriolis effect. This is the last thing that you'll write there. Uh, so wind is the movement of molecules in the air uh, and the winds in our atmosphere are driven by heat energy from the sun. We've, kind of, we've already mentioned that before, but just to reiterate, the winds in our atmosphere are driven by heat energy from the sun. There's an image here of how that vertical circulation works, but we don't need to get into uh, to great detail about that. 
So global air circulation. You're not writing anything on this screen, but you will on the next for our last section here. Uh, so the rotation of the earth causes the winds to uh, not move straight from the equator to the poles. The winds are, are trying to head uh, from the equator to the poles, but because of the rotation of the earth, those winds are being pushed uh, and they kind of, they end up in a, uh, in a circular sort of pattern. Uh, so these distinct, they're called convection cells. Uh, they form over each hemisphere and create trade winds, which are called the, uh, we have, they create trade winds, westerlies and easterlies. And we're going to define what each of those are. So uh, from this slide, I, I don't have it all in bold here, but you're going to get as much of this as you can. You need to know we're defining each of these terms, trade winds, westerlies, and polar easterlies. Uh, last one, but a, a pretty good amount of writing for this last one. So trade winds are permanent east to west prevailing winds that flow in the Earth's equatorial region. We're going to focus more on, on westerlies versus easterlies. Uh, so your westerlies are prevailing winds from the west. That's going to be very important when it comes time for the test. Uh, your, your westerlies are not going west. They're coming from the west and heading in an eastward direction. And you will also need to know that they occur between uh, 30 and 60 degrees latitude. And then your easterlies are going to be on the, the polar ends uh, beyond where the rest of the westerlies are. It's going to be a dry, cold, prevailing wind uh, that blows around high pressure areas of the, uh, the polar high. So the North and the South Pole. Uh, I'll give you an image of, of how this works here. So you've got your, your trade winds from zero to 30 your westerlies from 30 to 60, and then your polar easterlies. So they end up, uh, it ends up being a sort of a, a circular motion that these winds are traveling in, but primary focus on the idea that, um, that for westerlies, they are, are coming from the west and then know those latitudes of, of 30 to 60. For westerlies that's going to be what we want to have for our test at the end of the unit and that appears to be it we'll move on uh, in a couple of days with 5.2 separate circulation have a good day peace